By the end of 1860, the cords that had bound the Union together had snapped. The second party system had collapsed, and it was replaced by a system that accentuated, rather than muted, regional controversies. The federal government was no longer a remote, unthreatening presence. The need to resolve the status of the territories had made it necessary for Washington to deal directly with sectional issues through the use of troops. In short, the election of 1860 precipitated the most terrible war in United States history. As soon as news of Abraham Lincoln's election reached the South, militant leaders began to demand an end to the Union. South Carolina, along the hotbed of Southern separatism, seceded while President Buchanan was still in office after Lincoln had won the election. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas all seceded afterwards in a matter of weeks. Those delegates met in Montgomery, Alabama to form a new nation, the Confederate States of America. They seized all federal property within their boundaries and attempted to take Fort Sumter outside of um, Carolina, which is an off offshore military installation. All of this happened before Lincoln assumed office. He'd won the election, but he had not even assumed office yet, which, which typically happens in, um, in the new year. When an effort at compromise called the Crittenden Compromise failed, Lincoln warned that secession was insurrectionary and that the government would hold, occupy, and possess all federal property in seceded states. The Confederates promptly bombed Fort Sumter for two days, and the war had unofficially begun. After the fight at Fort Sumter, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina all joined the Confederate States of America. The most important material advantages for waging the war lay in the North. The South had no ability to manufacture even its own munitions or its weapons and bullets. The North had a much better transportation system, and the Confederate railroads, which were already um, limited and in poor condition, crumbled by 1864. Conversely, though, the southern armies had the advantage of fighting on their own turf, and northern armies always had to deal with hostile locals, all while running communications back to Washington before making movements. The commitment of the white population to the Confederate cause was clear and firm all across the South. In the North, though, opinion on the war was more divided, and support re remained shaky until, essentially, Lincoln's death. A major southern victory at any one of several crucial moments might have proved decisive in breaking the North's will to continue to fight the South. In addition, the South's economic ties to English and French textile industries inclined global leaders to favor the Confederate cause over the Union cause, and the South kept hoping that one or more um, European nations, specifically uh, Britain and maybe France, might eventually join their cause against the North. In the North, after most slave states seceded, the Republican Party enjoyed almost unchallenged federal supremacy. During the war, it enacted aggressively nationalistic programs to promote economic development, including in its western territories. The Homestead Act permitted any man to purchase 160 acres of public land out west as long as he lived on it and developed it for a period of five years. So it was an invitation for people to move west, just walk onto uh, public land, live there for five years. It was essentially theirs. The Morrill Act transferred still more public land to state governments in the North, which they sold to help launch public universities and colleges, so-called land-grant institutions. This is how a lot of big universities today um, got their land and got their start. The Fed also spurred completion of a transcontinental railroad, which meant at Promontory Point, Utah, they created a new national banking system that removed most of the uncertainty surrounding the nation's currency, and the North funded its war by levying some taxes, selling paper currency for the first time, but mostly they borrowed money from banks, uh, and some of it from the sale of bonds to ordinary citizens. And I, I should mention here, I talked about how the Republican Party enjoyed almost um, unchallenged federal supremacy in the Union. There were still uh, Democrats in the North, and there were still slave states in the North, though only a handful, so there was still political turmoil in the North, even though the Republican Party um, was largely in control after those states seceded. With only 16,000 troops in the army before the war, the North was forced to raise its own military from scratch. The bulk of the fighting would have to be done by volunteers from state militias. Congress authorized enlisting half a million volunteers, it's 500,000 volunteers, for new three-year terms. They used to just serve just a couple of months in the Federal Army.
By March of 1863, with enthusiasm for the war pretty much tapped out in the Union, Congress was forced to pass on a national draft law to beef up the ranks of its military. Virtually all young males were eligible to be drafted, although a man could escape service by hiring someone to go in his place or by paying a $300 fine. So no rich man who wanted to avoid the war had to go to war. To many who were accustomed to a, to a remote national government conscription, the act of um, the draft, was uh, strange and threatening. Opposition to the draft was widespread in the North, particularly, uh, particularly um, to those who opposed the war entirely. Occasionally, draft riots turned violent, as they did in 1863 in New York City. Their rioters turned their anger toward African Americans who lived in the city, burning black homes, lynching free blacks, and even targeting an African American orphanage. Only the arrival of federal troops direct from the Battle of Gettysburg halted the violence. Over uh, nearly 100 people, um, most of them black, were killed. Um, we tend to think of anti-war uh, demonstrations as a product of Vietnam, but um, any time a federal government, at least in America, any time the federal government attempts to draft people, to force them, to conscript them, to join war, um, some people rebel. Lincoln arrived in Washington after his election with a solid understanding of his own and his party's weaknesses. He fairly famously assembled a cabinet representing every faction of the Republican Party and every segment of Northern opinion. Um, the book Team of Rivals is all, and, and to some extent, the, the newer film Lincoln um, from 2012 are all about that. He boldly used his war power, sometimes ignoring constitutional limits on his executive power. For instance, he never formally declared a declaration of war against the South because he argued the conflict was a domestic insurrection. He increased the size of the military uh, without congressional authority, unilaterally proclaimed a naval blockade of the South, and even had newspaper editors critical of his cause imprisoned, essentially indefinitely until the war was over, within his free Union states. Lincoln's greatest problem, uh, undoubtedly, was the widespread popular opposition to the war, which is mobilized and, and capitalized on by those known as Peace Democrats, or more commonly, uh, they were called Copperheads. Lincoln ordered military arrests of civilian dissenters exercising their First Amendment rights and suspended the right of habeas corpus to those critical of enlistments. Habeas corpus, of course, is a speedy trial. So Lincoln had free people who were critical of the war in the North arrested, put in prison without a trial, uh, just to keep them quiet. By 1864, the North was in political turmoil, and Democrats within the Union nominated George McClellan, celebrated former Union general on an anti-war ticket that called for a truce with the South. Um, for a time, Lincoln's prospects at re-elections uh, seemed quite limited. At that crucial moment, though, Northern military victories, um, particularly the capture of Atlanta, Georgia, rejuvenated Northern morale and boosted Republican Party prospects well enough that Lincoln was able to win re-election pretty comfortably. Um, the Electoral College vote looks funny, but there are fewer states, so he won 212 to 21. So he didn't win by a sizable margin, but he won pretty much all of the Union states. And some of those Union states, remember, um, were slave states still at this point. Not very many, though. Despite the unity in supporting the war and efforts at nationalization, that's what Republicans could agree on, they disagreed sharply with one another on the matter of slavery. Radical Republicans um, wanted to use the war to abolish slavery immediately and completely. And that's what they called um, these folks, radical Republicans. They wanted to um, abolish slavery completely and immediately. Conservative Republicans, on the other hand, favored a more cautious approach, in part to placate the slave states that remained, however precariously, within the Union still. They didn't want other states to leave the Union. Regardless, momentum began to gather behind emancipation early in the war. In 1861, Congress passed the Confiscation Act, which declared that all slaves used in support of the Confederate Army would be considered free during the conflict. So if any northern soldiers came upon um, slaves who were digging ditches or anything like that for the Confederates, they would be freed immediately. A second Confiscation Act in 1862 declared free the slaves of persons supporting the insurrection and authorized the president to employ African-Americans as northern soldiers. So when they came across 
um, civilians who had slaves uh, that they they essentially freed them on the spot as if those people were um, for the Southern cause. And um, the president began to employ African Americans as Northern soldiers that made that that made that illegal in 1862. As the war progressed, many in the North began to accept emancipation or the freeing of slaves it was a central aim of the war. No smaller accomplishment would justify or could justify the enormous sacrifices the struggle required. So the war had to become about something. As a result, the radicals gained influence within the Republican Party, and Lincoln worked to champion their cause. Uh, Lincoln did not come to office as a radical Republican, but after the war dragged on and on and the people of the North were tired of it and wanted to give up, he made it about something else. He championed their cause. After the Union victory at Antietam, the president announced his intention to use his war powers to issue an executive order to free all the slaves of the Confederacy. And on January 1st of 18, excuse me, yep, 1863, he formally signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared forever free the slaves inside the Confederacy. This notably did not include uh, slaves still residing in northern slave states, which included Tennessee, the new uh, state of West Virginia, and uh, some state, uh, some slaves in uh, Louisiana. Remember, a lot of Republicans simply wanted to declare a truce with the South. They had joined the war, but they weren't enthusiastic about it. When Lincoln made it about freeing slaves, they had a moral imperative to keep fighting, where before the South had done a pretty good job uh, making it very clear that they weren't going down without a fight, and perhaps the North ought to let them form and keep their own nation. That's how a lot of people felt. But Lincoln made the war about something else. Although his Emancipation Proclamation on the first day of 1863 had no immediate impact on those slaves in the South, the do document irrevocably established that the war was being fought to both preserve the Union and free African slaves, and as federal armies came to occupy much of the South, the proclamation became a practical reality. In 1865, Congress approved and the states ratified the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which abolished slavery in all parts of the United States. After more than two centuries, legalized slavery of African Americans finally ceased to exist on American soil. 186,000 emancipated blacks eventually served as soldiers, sailors, and laborers in the Union forces. So they were a big part of the Union, Union force. Yet early in the war, African Americans were largely excluded from the military. Most black soldiers were assigned menial tasks behind the lines even after 1862. They were paid significantly less than their white counterparts, and when captured, they often faced brutal execution by Confederate soldiers. The war mobilized women into unfamiliar roles outside the home and made them a dominant force in the field of nursing. This is the first time women really become nurses, which they're still known for. Other women came to see the war as an opportunity to win support for their own goals. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony worked simultaneously for the abolition of slavery and for women's suffrage, the right for women to vote. The South. The Confederate Constitution was almost identical to the Constitution of the United States, with several significant differences. The document explicitly acknowledged the sovereignty of individual states, which, which made um, the states more important, in a sense, in the South sanctioned slavery and it made its abolition of slavery practically impossible by the terms of the Constitution. I guess when I say um, the sovereignty of individual states, what I mean is it's not the United States of, of, of America where we, together we are one, it's the Confederate States of America. Notice how the word state comes first. I guess if it comes to it, the Southern Constitution put the state first as the most important part of the Confederacy. We'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was named a provisional president at the Constitutional Convention, really wasn't opposed, and later he was elected to a six-year term by the people of the South of the Confederacy. Although there were no formal political parties in the Confederacy, states' rights quickly became a cult among many white Southerners who made virtually all efforts to exert national authority impossible. And this is that states' rights part. States' rights enthusiasts obstructed conscription, the effort to draft Southerners into the cause, and restricted all of Davis's bold efforts to win the war, even at very desperate times. Some Confederate governors even tried to keep their own troops separate from the Confederate army. And so a true Confederacy would kind of look like that, where the states would work cooperatively. Each state would have its own governor in charge. Each state would have its own military. 
But the South did nationalize and doesn't look a whole lot different from the Union. That's why essentially the war becomes about slavery and not about states' right, states' rights. Uh, the states' rights sediment um, was a significant handicap, but the South still took steps in the direction of centralization. Uh, the South, so the Confederacy, which is all about states' rights, actually seized control of Southern railroads from private ownership. They impressed slaves to work as laborers on military projects. They took people's property, slaves, and, and took them for their own use to work for the military, which is clearly not a states' rights um, idea and doesn't support that goal. And they permitted soldiers to uh, feed themselves by seizing Southern crops from farms in, in their path. It's the so-called food draft. So the Confederate Army, as it faces the Northern Army, has to become a lot like the Northern Army. The Confederacy nationalizes, even though they set off to become this independent um, Confederacy of independent states. They end up acting a lot like the North. To pay for the war, the Confederates enacted an income tax, which only raised 1% of the government's total income. Borrowing was not much more successful, and that was the main way that Nor um, the Union funded itself. So they went to European markets where they attempted to use cotton as leverage, but they still failed to raise money. The Confederacy then was forced to pay for the war through the highly unstable system of selling paper currency to banks and, and to the people. By 1864, just a few years later, the Confederacy had issued $1.5 billion in paper money, resulting in, well, not resulting in, a result of disastrous inflation. Inflation was a problem in the North, too, so the North began to print money and sell it as a way to raise money very, very quickly. Um, say a five-cent loaf of bread, which cost um, five cents at the beginning of the war in the North, ended up costing nine cents. So prices of pretty much everything almost doubled in the North um, during those five years, which is a lot. It would be like if um, gas at, at $3.25 now went up. So it went up by 80 or 90 percent. So It'd be like if gas went up to about six bucks um, in just a few years. It would be a lot to deal with, um, but we could probably deal with it if we had to. It would be uncomfortable, but it, you know, the people would react. We'd probably drive less, but we'd, we'd make do. A five cent loaf of bread in the Confederacy in the beginning of the war would eventually cost $4.50 by the end of the war. There's so much inflation. The South just prints money, prints money, prints money, and um, things are absurd. You want to buy milk, it's like $30, and this is when $30 is a lot of money in the South. People don't have enough paper. You'd have to hand over a stack of, of paper money the size of, um, the size of your head to buy a loaf of bread, I'm sure. You occasionally hear this, um, this term, Confederate money. It means it's no good. It means it's meaningless. The Southern economy fell, fell steeply into chaos throughout the war, and the government responded by printing Confederate money that was virtually worthless. So even if the South had somehow won the war, they would have had to deal with this major problem of, of goods being worth not nearly as much as the money they could get. It was, it was a disaster. Like the United States, the Confederacy enacted a conscription act which subjected all white males between the ages of 18 and 35 to military service for three years. Enthusiasm for the war was strong enough to support conscription for a time <clears throat> but by 1864, the Confederate Army faced a critical manpower shortage. In a frantic final attempt to raise men, the Congress authorized conscription of 300,000 slaves, but the war ended before the government could attempt this incongruous experiment. So the South does all this crazy stuff. They print piles and piles of money that, are, that become worthless. They almost try to put all their slaves to fight the war for them, but that doesn't work either. The war made the economies of the North hum as the production of goods increased. In the South, it their economy declined by more than a third during the war. Fighting itself wreaked havoc on the southern landscape, destroying farmland towns, cities, and the railroads. Food and supply shortages, just insane dollar inflation, and just carnage, general carnage in the South created instability, instability in southern society. The war forced society, both in the North and the South, to question the prevailing assumption that females were not suited for the public sphere since so many women had to perform non-traditional, non-domestic tasks during the conflict. The war decimated the male population. After the war, women outnumbered men by significant margins, especially in the South. As a result, a larger number of unmarried and widowed women had no choice 
but to find employment after the war, an unintended consequence to be sure. Strategy and Diplomacy Militarily, uh, President Lincoln understood that to re-secure the Union, to reunite the North and the South, he needed to destroy the Confederate armies and not merely to occupy Southern territory. He struggled, though, to find a general who shared his ideology. The promotion, the promotion of George B. McClellan, the man he would face in 1864, Democrat for the presidency, um, was a disappointment for Lincoln early in the war effort. So he was a war general who would not, um, who did not share Lincoln's vision and refused to move his troops as quickly or as aggressively as Lincoln wanted. Lincoln's handling of the war effort often faced scrutiny, too, from the Committee on the Conduct of War, which is a joint investigative committee comprised of members of both the House and the Senate. So people were writing Lincoln about his progress, and he didn't have the generals to make the progress he wanted. Not until March of 1864 did Lincoln finally get a general he trusted to command the war effort. He was uh, Ulysses S. Grant from Galena, Illinois. He shared Lincoln's belief in unremitting combat. He, he understood that the brutal, um, brutal outcome of the war would be necessary, that the South had to be crushed in order for the Union to come back together. In the South, President Jefferson Davis controlled all aspects of Confederate military, military strategy um, throughout the war. Interestingly, officers for both militaries were typically trained at West Point or at the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis. It was the same group of people that were fighting each other on the North and the South, at least as far as the, the people in command went. They'd known each other, essentially. A northern blockade kept ocean-going ships out of Confederate ports, and the North's naval advantage was used to great effect on the lakes and rivers of the Western theater of war, and the, the South had no significant navy of its own. Diplomacy between the two sides also proved a decisive factor in the war. At the beginning of the conflict, Sympathies of the ruling classes of England and France lay largely with the Confederacy, partly because the nations imported so much southern cotton. Both England and France were also eager to see a weaker United States because the United States had increasingly become a very powerful rival to them in world commerce. The people of England and France, not the leaders though, favored the North, especially the anti-slavery movements in both countries. In the end, no European nation offered diplomatic recognition to the Confederacy, let alone intervene in the conflict. No nation wanted to antagonize the United States unless the Confederacy seemed likely to win. And don't get me wrong, the Confederacy did seem likely to win, and at that point, um, the Confederacy really believed that Britain would join their cause because no one likes to pick a loser. Um, so Britain was always in this relationship, or at least the leaders of Britain, of England, were always at this point of, well, if, you can, if, if, if it looks like the scales are going to tip to the Confederacy, maybe we'll consider kind of recognizing them or even joining them in the conflict. They never do, though. Both powers remain neutral in the conflict, both England and France. Although the British did um, sell these big uh, commerce destroyer ships to the Confederacy at a uh, critical point in the war, which um, really upset the Union. Much of what happened on the actual battlefields of the Civil War was a result of new technologies that transformed the nature of armed combat forever. Advances in iron and steel technology, the introduction of the repeating uh, pistol by Samuel Colt, and then the repeating rifle by Oliver Winchester in 1860, plus the improvement of cannons and artillery all served to make the um, Civil War the first modern high casualty war. It was now impossibly deadly to fight battles as they had been fought for centuries. Soldiers quickly learned that the new proper position for combat was to stay low and to find cover. In the past, of course, soldiers had stood in fields and fired volleys of low-accuracy uh, low artillery at one another. Um, now they uh, were forced to hit the ground because they were going to get shot because rifles were accurate and the bullets came much more quickly. For the first time in history, infantry did not fight in formation and the battlefield became a much more chaotic place and a much more deadly place. That deadliness of the new weapons forced armies to spend a great deal of time building fortifications and trenches to protect themselves. And we see those trenches, that kind of warfare, coming to its own in World War I. Uh, ironclad ships, even torpedoes, and submarine technology all make fleeting appearances in the 1860s, suggesting dramatic changes that would soon overtake uh, naval warfare specifically. They used hot air balloons and um, to spy on enemy positions, and the first um, machine guns are used during the Civil War. <laughs> Critical to the conduct of the war, however, were two relatively 
um, new technologies, the railroad and the telegraph. The railroad was particularly important in mobilizing uh, the millions of soldiers who would fight in the war. Transporting such numbers of soldiers and their supplies would have been impossible without the railroad. Commanders organized their campaigns around the locations of the rail, so where the lines were, that's kind of what dictated where the troops would go, because it was so easy to jump on them. And the concentrating quality of rail travel encouraged commanders to organize much bigger battles. Like the rail line, um, telegraph lines were of significant importance to the North because they had to communicate with Washington all the time, so they strung up telegraph wires all along the routes. The field commanders were able to stay in close touch with one another and with Washington during battles. In the absence of direct intervention by European powers, and with a clear understanding of the uniqueness of their conflict, the two contestants, the Northern Army and the Confederate States of America, were left to resolve their conflict by sheer bloodshed. They did so over the course of four years of brutal combat. More than 618,000 Americans died as a result of the conflict, more than the totals of World War I and World War II combined. World War I, with its brutal trench warfare, killed 112,000 American men. World War II, uh, 405,000 Americans. So now we get to the war, um, the, actual, uh, the actual combat itself. I will not narrate for you an exhaustive narrative of the ebb and flow of all the four years of combat, but I will highlight important turning points in the war. In the opening clashes of the war after Fort Sumter, the Union suffered high-profile losses on what we'll call the, the Virginian Front. But they, did, um, they had some minor successes. They liberated um, West Virginia, the anti-secession mountain people, and they created their own state in 1863. They did well in the West. The Union seized the city of New Orleans and controlled the minor Western theater of the war by 1862. But this is the time, the first three years of the war, that Lincoln um, saw his support Wayne saw the people of the North um, rally against his war, saw the people of the North revolt against his conscription, against his draft, um, almost saw himself lose in 1864. In the East, Union General George McClellan, the man who had run against Lincoln in 1864, refused to advance as quickly as Lincoln wanted, and he would sit there and train his soldiers instead of moving them forward. And Lincoln later went on to fire uh, McClellan. But the, and so the Confederacy won most of the conflicts those first few years of the war, leading up to General Grant's siege of Vicksburg in 1863. Before Vicksburg and Gettysburg, the Northern cause um, looked like it was um, hopeless, and it looked like the North and the people of the North would want a truce with the South because they were tired of fighting. Soon after, General U Ulysses S. Grant, though, um, seized Vic Vicksburg in 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg, the most um, famous battle of the war, Southern General Robert E. Lee, uh, his retreat was a turning point in the conflict, and the weakened Confederate forces were never able again to threaten Northern territory. By 1864, General uh, S. Grant became um, General-in-Chief of all Union armies, and he pursued uh, Robert E. Lee's troops all across the South. Under Grant's direction, and on instruction from Lincoln himself, General William Tecumseh Sherman took Atlanta and then implemented what Lincoln had wanted all along, which was um, the march to the sea. It's total war, is what the policy is called. William Tecumseh Sherman took his troops and cut a 60-mile-wide swath of destruction and desolation across the state of Georgia, depriving Confederates of materials and transportation lines. He ripped up rail lines, but most importantly, he broke the will of the southern people by burning towns and plantations along the route and killing civilians. He took Savannah, Georgia, and then moved northward until he hit North Carolina, virtually unopposed along the entire route of destruction. I don't mean to suggest that William T. Sherman personally was out there killing civilians, but um, with his troops spread out like that, um, they took advantage of the situation to be sure they robbed Southerners set fire to farms and certainly killed innocent people. But it was just the thing that Lincoln and Grant wanted because it took total war in their minds to end the conflict uh, with the South, to break the will of the Southern people to get them to reunite with the North. Grant's own Army of the Potomac worked tirelessly to take Richmond, uh, the Southern capital. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, and others set fire to their city as they fled. So times quickly get desperate for the South after um, Gettysburg, especially after um, Sherman marches to the sea. And Lincoln himself was president, president, uh, president excuse me, and president as Union forces took the city of Richmond. 
Lee's army, down to 25,000 men, moved west, but arranged to meet Ulysses S. Grant in Virginia, where on April 9th he surrendered what was left of his forces. Uh, essentially, after um, the Union had seized the southern capital, um, all was lost for the south. The other Confederate armies surrendered a few days later to Sherman. Jefferson Davis was soon captured in Georgia. They don't give up without a fight, but they're simply down to, to no men. And the few diehards who continue to fight um, the southern cause for the cause of slavery, for the cause of secession, for the cause of independence and a new form of freedom, that is freedom from nationalism, uh, they quickly collapsed. And so the North is left to deal with um, the conflicts of this secession.